I'm John Sadler, president of Sadler Sports and Recreation Insurance, and I'm reaching out today to national sports associations, including sanctioning and governing bodies, as well as our local member organizations. The topic is how to design an effective risk management program that doesn't have the opposite effect of actually increasing liability, as is unfortunately the case with many poorly designed safety programs. I'm going to be talking about some important concepts that you might not have heard of before, so you might want to have a pen and paper handy to take notes. It's important to discuss the theory behind how to properly set up an effective risk management program for a volunteer-run organization. We can't expect as much out of our volunteers as compared to professional paid employees. Volunteers are generally not going to be as well trained, have less time to commit, and have fewer resources as compared to paid employees. This needs to be taken into account when designing a risk management program. I also want to talk about why local organizations are reluctant to adopt and implement risk management programs. Most just pay at lip service. I also wanted to discuss the legal pitfalls to avoid and the critical sections that should be covered in any risk management program. And finally, at the end, after we talk about theory, I'm going to offer an effective risk management program in a Word doc template that can be easily customized for any sport or local organization. Risk management programs need to be in writing and distributed to all administrators and staff. Otherwise, it's safe to say that risk management won't happen. The written document becomes your training manual. It's passed down from one group of volunteers to the next. The average tour of duty for a youth sports volunteer is only three years, so there's a lot of turnover and the need to constantly train and educate. It also serves to document your training program to show the judge and jury how much you care, which is of course very important as you will look ridiculous if you don't have any training in place. I've been told by a number of well-respected recreation professionals that the practice of risk management in the sports setting is as simple as educating staff on how to recognize the most common areas of risk, such as physical hazards, unsafe acts and conditions, and how to respond to them. The response requires both taking immediate corrective action, if feasible, and notifying the risk management officer in writing. For example, if an exposed sprinkler head is found during a soccer practice, the coach should immediately put a cone over it, resume practice, and notify the risk management officer in writing. Another example is if a lightning storm is approaching during a baseball game, and if the 30-30 lightning rule is being ignored by the coaches and umpire, a responsible coach should speak up and insist upon immediate postponement and inform the risk management officer to review and reinforce the rule again with staff. Over my 25 plus year career, I've found that there's a lot of reluctance for local organizations to adopt and implement risk management. They're afraid that if they put something in writing and then don't follow through, that they will have even more liability than if they didn't have a written program in the first place. They're often sent to a seminar on risk management or take an online course, and they're asked to develop their own written program from the theory that is taught, which of course no volunteer will have the time to follow through on. Most available risk management program templates that can be purchased are not volunteer friendly and tend to be designed for paid employees, and they're too long, too time consuming, and overwhelming for volunteers to customize and whittle down. And finally, no risk management program will ever work if a single risk management officer is not assigned who has accountability to implement the program and authority to make day-to-day -day decisions. Safety programs can be a double-edged sword if not set up correctly. From the perspective of the National Sports Association, use of the word safe or safety in marketing materials on a website or in a risk management program can be twisted around to a guarantee of safety and risk-free participation and can be used against you in a lawsuit. 
I've seen this happen to Little League in their highly publicized abuse molestation lawsuit when their material said that they provided a safe and wholesome environment for youth. And in the recent Pop Warner lawsuits over brain injury where online material said that they were a safety first organization. The word safety is often front and center in these lawsuits. And then, if you claim your program is safe, you likely have created a legal duty to police and enforce compliance at the local level. From the perspective of the local organization, failure to adhere to your own safety standard is an obvious case of negligence, which can be very damaging. I would recommend that the words safe and safety be eliminated from your materials altogether or to the greatest extent possible. If you're going to use these words anyway, you should mitigate their impact by clarifying in writing that safety means an attempt to make safer and disclaiming that the use of the word is not a guarantee of risk-free participation. Of course, using the word safer is better than safe. A better and less risky way to explain things is to say that like any sport or activity, your particular sport entails risk, but the benefits of participation greatly outweigh the risks. Furthermore, representations of safe participation can be used by plaintiff's counsel as an argument to invalidate the risk warning in a waiver release agreement. In my opinion, you should use the word risk management in connection with your program instead of safety. Risk management has more of a connotation that you're taking the steps to protect your organization and insurance carrier against litigation, but are not necessarily guaranteeing safety in any way. If you let something slip between the cracks, despite your best efforts, and don't follow your own risk management guidelines, that is likely less damaging than failure to follow your own safety standards. I've been a part of a number of conversations with legal counsel advising national sports sanctioning bodies on the issues of abuse molestation and brain injury concussion. The attorneys say that mandating rules and regulations can create a legal duty to police and enforce for compliance and that such a legal duty may not have existed in the first place. Council's advice is to only mandate on the local level if the National Association has the ability to and will actually police and enforce compliance on the local level. If not, the National Association should instead merely recommend and make the risk management resources available. Now, if you can police and enforce, mandating is fine. Examples would be for national teams supervised by your trained staff, tournaments that are hosted by the sanctioning body, or when a national association takes control of running background checks on all local staff. It's common for national associations to be wrongfully shotgunned into lawsuits when incidents occur at the local level. The plaintiff's attorneys always allege that the national association hired the local staff and that national has someone on location who is in charge. Of course, that is just not true in most cases, but we've had success with many of our clients by drafting an operational control provision that they inserted into their rulebook or membership agreement, which clarifies that the National Association has no operational control and thus no liability for these local incidents. This provision has been successfully used by Defense Council to have our National Association clients drop from lawsuits quickly and inexpensively. The words shall and should have specific legal consequences in risk management programs. Shall denotes a mandatory requirement with no deviation allowed, similar to the word must. On the other hand, should denotes a guideline or recommendation where non-compliance is permissible based on individual judgment. However, there may still be a moral obligation to comply. It is better to use the word should in two situations. First, if a national association can't police and enforce locally, and second, 
to protect the local organization from the liability risk of noncompliance if they fail to meet a guideline. Another strategy to reduce the risk of failure of your volunteers to fully comply with the risk management guidelines is to position your program as an awareness training program. In a perfect world, all recommendations and checklist items in the program should be complied with, but when you're talking about volunteer-run programs, that's not likely to occur 100% of the time. And that's why it's legally risky to position your program as a mandatory checklist of items that must be completed. I first noticed many years ago that Little League called their program a safety awareness program. Now, I didn't like the use of the word safety, but I did like use of the word awareness. I figured out that they used the word awareness to help to protect their local leagues in the event that they did not follow through and implement all of the written program, and I think this is a smart approach. Of course, there are exceptions, such as when requirements are mandated by state or federal legislation, the governing body, or the insurance carrier. An example here would be state legislation that requires mandatory concussion risk management steps to be taken. The formal risk management process taught in textbooks teaches to practice risk identification, measurement, assessment, avoidance, contractual transfer, and loss control first, and then to figure out how to pay for losses that can't be prevented last. However, in a volunteer-run risk management program, I like to key in on the task in order of the most important and easiest to comply with first in case the volunteers never get around to doing everything they're supposed to do. My program template starts out with the types of insurance policies to be carried along with the required limits and coverages followed by contractual transfer, avoiding high-risk activities with special emphasis on areas such as abuse, molestation, and brain injury, followed by some awareness education training on the most common areas that result in lawsuits. Contractual transfer is a critical issue when it comes to protecting both the National Association and the local organizations and their loss records with the insurance carrier. However, most risk management programs don't even address this issue. Contractual transfer means that one party's responsibility for paying for damages is transferred to another party by contract. Typically, the stronger party transfers its obligation to pay for certain damages to the weaker party by way of waiver release or indemnification hold harmless provision or additional insured status under a general liability policy. Examples of when contractual transfer is used offensively by the sports organization would be with its own participants, outside groups at lease or sublease facilities, visiting teams when you host tournaments, or when vendors are hired, such as umpire crews or janitorial. When the sports organization leases facilities from facility owners, the sports organization as the weaker party often has contractual transfer requirements imposed on it in the lease or permit. The sports organization needs to make sure that it meets the insurance requirements and that the indemnification hold harmless provision is equitable. When I say equitable, I mean that the sports organization doesn't want to assume liability when the facility owner is 100% negligent. Our risk management template provides guidance on all these contractual transfer issues, whether in the offensive or defensive mode, and we have many excellent resources on waiver release, as well as how to negotiate situations where unfair indemnification hold harmless transfers are imposed on sports organizations. One of the basic cornerstones of the risk management process is to avoid high-risk activities that are not mission critical, which are known to result in severity claims with large damages. And if you can't avoid them, you must take steps to mitigate the risk by the use of loss control techniques. A list of some of the most common high-risk area situations are on this page. 
I'm amazed when I look back over my career at the number of times a swimming entertainment event resulted in a death or permanent disability situation. These mishaps seem to occur even when adult volunteers are on lifeguard duty. If you're going to have a swimming function, I recommend only having such events at locations where the facility provides the lifeguards. Certain risks are so important that they deserve their own separate risk management programs. Abuse and molestation and brain injury are examples. These are also two areas where local organizations must go further than just awareness training and actually implement what is required by state legislation and insurance carriers. We've developed a separate abuse molestation risk management template that is six pages long that covers everything from A to Z. A lot of organizations make the mistake of just shooting from the hip and running background checks without a written program in place. And that's a great way to get your pants suit off for a number of offenses such as the Fair Credit Reporting Act violations, libel and slander for not safeguarding confidential information, and inconsistent application of disqualification criteria. You need to have your written program in place with how you're going to administer the program before the first background check is run. Also, brain injury is a huge issue right now, which is perceived by the insurance industry as much more of a serious threat than abuse molestation. We've developed two different brain injury risk management templates, one for lower risk concussion sports and another one for higher risk concussion sports. Our simple programs cover all the bases that are required by state legislation and that are recommended by the CDC and the governing bodies. The final part of an effective risk management program should include the categories of lawsuits listed on this page. Whenever I research sports case law and the sports risk management textbooks, these are the categories where the vast majority of lawsuits arise, and if you scan the insurance loss runs of my clients, they will confirm these categories. Under each one of these categories, I reverse engineered the case law to come up with awareness and response guidelines that would eliminate or reduce most of these lawsuits. We offer a 17-page risk management template in Word doc format, which avoids many of the common legal pitfalls and provides a great education on how to recognize and respond to risk. This template is easily customizable for almost any sport. In addition, we do have separate program templates for abuse molestation and brain injury, which can add another eight pages. Please contact me if you have any questions or if you'd like to access these templates. Thanks for your time today.